Uh, John chapter number 9, verse number 24, it reads like this. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know that this man, speaking of Jesus, is a sinner. That's what they said. Verse number 25, he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know is that uh, I was blind, but now I see. <laughs> Check out verse number 25 as I calls for consideration. He says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know is that I was blind, and now I can see. Look at two people and say, I can see clearly now. I can see. I can see clearly now. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. I can see clearly now. I can see clearly now. It was author Douglas Otadi that said this, and I quote, The church is to be in, with, against and for the world. Check that out. The church is to be in, with, against, and for the world. That is, that the church, both universally and locally, has a unique responsibility with the culture. The church is to be in the world, but not of the world. Or, or for the sake of this series, in the streets, but not of the the streets. What, what does that even mean, though? What, what does that mean to be in the world but not of the world? In the streets but not in the streets. What, 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 does, what does that mean? Most often, that passage, when interpreted, is typically said in this light, that Christians or the church ought to be careful not to consume culture's contamination. I think that that's true, though. I think that that's real. But that might be, that, while that's not incorrect, it might be a bit incomplete. The definition it's, it's more than that, because if we're honest, it's nearly impossible uh, to escape or be exposed or not be exposed to some of the things happening in the culture. Like, you cannot be connected to the streets and not be exposed to the streets. I'll come get you in a second. It's almost, it's, it's almost the same as saying you, you can't have social media without ever seeing anything crazy. It's going to happen. You're going to run across that person with no profile picture but has something to say about everything negative. They just watch you for years, but they never say anything until there's something they disagree with, right? So it, it's, it, that's a reality, right? That's a reality. So the, that definition, the, the definition that I think is important is that that one is not incorrect, but it might be incomplete because if we're honest, we're going to be exposed to it at some level. Watch this. But the believer is not to be simply separate from the streets. It's to be samples for the streets. The believers ought to be samples, examples, models, blueprints, templates for the streets. And God's desire is for each and every one of us not just to be distant, but to be different. Are y'all here? Distance causes irrelevancy where difference speaks to peculiarity. Mm, that's good. Distance seems arrogant. Difference speaks to assignment. Distance seems prideful. Difference speaks to purpose. If the church is too disconnected from the sounds of the streets, we won't be able to discern what the streets need. Are y'all here? If we're so connected from the sounds of the street, what's happening not just in here, but out there, then we won't be able to discern what it is that the streets need. Watch this. This is extremely important because we have been created not to be distant, but to be different. We have been destined with a difference. We have peculiar purpose. We have been handpicked with a variant. And all I'm saying is that God created you and I intentionally. He wired us for his work. He, we, he created us for his call. He designed us for his destiny. And this is extremely important. If nobody has told you this uh, and you walked in here, it's your first time or your first time in a long time, I want to speak this over your life, that you have purpose. 
Yeah. The number one Googled question in the world is what is my purpose? I'm getting ready to tell you what the purpose is, but I want you to know that you have purpose. You have, you have a divine purpose. God created you with intentionality. You're not the consequence, you're not the consequence, the consequence of some cosmic coincidence. You, you, your mother and your father may not have planned you, but God did. Y'all ain't saying nothing. He's, he has a plan for you. He has a plan for you. He has purpose for you. And that's good news for somebody because if you've ever felt like you, you have not been walking fully in your purpose, if you've ever felt like you've been in a season where the eyes of your heart are not matching the things that you see with the eyes in your head, I want you to know something about purpose. you got to understand this, is that our purpose will be realized when God's purpose is recognized. I'm just laying some foundation. That our purpose will be realized when God's purpose is recognized. It's when we submit to God's purpose first. I know, I know that's not popular because we want to know about our plan and what I want to do. And, and, and I need three steps on what I need to do. And now all of that's good in this place. But I want to let you know something that you can never fully walk in purpose until you recognize God's purpose for your life. Your purpose, my purpose, is attached to God's purpose. And you can't get one, you can't get yours before you get his. That's what I'm trying to say. That's all I'm trying to say. I'm, I'm trying to say that you can't uncover yours, you can't discover yours until you discover his. Okay? This is extremely important, right? Because God's aim is for us to saturate the streets with love. He, his aim is for us to be billboards of his benevolence. His aim is that we take what happens in the sanctuary and we take it and let it overflow in the streets. Because if Jesus is a song, we are to be the speaker. If Jesus is a sweet perfume, we ought to be the sprayer. If Jesus is the software, we ought to be the screen, meaning we ought to be the thing that carries, conveys, and even circulates his love, in, not just in the sanctuary, but in the streets. I'm talking about the streets, y'all. We, we have to develop an anointing for both. Some people's Holy Ghost, I said that, some people's anointing only works in church. It only works. It only work when the organ playing, the keyboards playing, the drums are going. They only anoint. Only ho ho. They only anointed in church. Oh, right. What is that? You in Walmart? Oh, they think you crazy. You get. Oh. You know, fell in the frozen food aisle. So some people they they're only anointed for the pulpit. When God is saying, "I've given you purpose that extends beyond the pulpit," God. We are able to make our pulpits wherever we go. If I had time, I don't have time. But if I did, I would bother this and I would tell you how Abraham built an altar on the top of Mount Moriah. I, I will go through all of the prophets and how they would build an altar wherever they were. They didn't wait until they got into the sanctuary. In order so, so the question is, can, will you build an altar in the classroom? Will you build an altar at work? Will you build an altar in the boardroom? Will you build an altar with those teens that you work with? Will you build an altar with those adults that you work with? Will you build an altar with the men? Or do you wait till you get to church and then your Holy Ghost kicks in? Oh, boy. <laughs> you can't get up. Just keep going down. All right. So we're, not, not, we're anointed not just for stages and microphones, but for boardrooms and virtual Zooms. We're anointed not just for revivals, but roadsides, not just for conferences, but corner stores, not just for convocations, but classrooms. And this is interesting because God desires that we be the billboard of his benevolence. In other words, his generosity. We should look like God has been good to us. Come on. I'm coming to get you in a moment. Ain't not. I said that real hood. There's nothing worse than a believer looking worse, oh boy, busted, I just, I don't know what's going on, hello, girl, get yourself together, don't nobody want to worship that God, that God got you in your feelings like that, it's 7 a.m., it's too early for that, baby, 
We ought to be billboards. We ought to carry an essence about us that will make people not just attractive to us, but attractive to him. So, so this is extremely important uh, when we talk about how God desires for us to take the gospel uh, out of this us for and no more mentality and take it to the streets. That, that we are called to be about our father's business. That, 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 that in a real sense, we can take any space and make our pulpit there. We, we, we see Jesus in this text turning uh, we see Jesus turning the street corner into a pulpit. He turns the roadside into a prayer room. Watch what Jesus does in John chapter number eight. Before we get to John chapter nine, and verse number, uh, John chapter number nine, verse uh, John chapter eight, Jesus, they are getting ready to stone Jesus. And they want to stone Jesus uh, for a number of reasons. So what Jesus did was the text says in John chapter eight, he slipped away. Real smooth, like, hey, he saw them getting ready, and their voices was getting a little high, so he told the disciples, hey, yo, 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 right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, he did one of those. <laughs> he did one of those, and, and they were getting ready. They're picking up stones. They're getting ready to, they're getting ready to throw the stones at Jesus. It's John chapter 8, just context. They're getting ready to throw the stones at Jesus. Jesus told the disciples, uh-uh, look, uh, then boom. So they left. They picked the stones up. Then they, where did he go? Where did he go? Jesus slid away from them. Not because he was afraid. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't move. He didn't leave because he was afraid. He left because of what he knew he could do if he wanted to. That's called restriction. Spiritual maturity operates in restriction. Meaning, I could do this. I ain't going to do it. You know what? I'm going to just, I, I could, I could, I could allow you to throw the stone and you drop dead right then, but I'm not even going to do it. You know you're growing spiritually when you could do something and you don't do it anyway. I'll come get you. David, right? So David was in the cave. Um, well, no, I'm sorry. David was in the palace, and he was serving underneath Saul. Saul, so jealous, insecure, and arrogant. That's a bad combination. He's jealous, insecure, and arrogant uh, because of David and what David has accomplished. Saul, so jealous, it got to him. At one point, he couldn't even handle it. He just picks up a spear, and he... Throws the spear at David. David sees the spear going by. He did a matrix. He was... <laughs> Moves out the way. Spear gets stuck in the wall. Now, David is not just a songwriter, but he's a warrior. Yeah. Yeah. David killed. They made a song that says Saul killed his thousands. David, his tens of thousands. David ain't nothing to be played with. So Saul picking a fight with the wrong person. Saul throws the spear. David does the Neo in the Matrix, ducks it, gets stuck in the wall. David does not take the spear and throw it back at Saul. Restriction. I could, but I won't. Some of us got to get that. I know you can end the whole conversation with one post. I know it. it, it this thing will be over, I promise you. Some of y'all got the screenshots in this seat. Lord, lift your hands and receive. Y'all got, y'all got screenshots just in case. I bet you he won't. I promise you one thing. Oh, boy. <laughs> Try this again. Because <laughs> y'all know y'all got those screenshots. Y'all got the text thread that go back to 2017. No, because you had said, and then you told me, and then you told. All right. <laughs> so, so Jesus slips away, not because he was in fear, but because he was operating in restraint. Jesus is not only our Savior, but he's our example. He's showing us what spiritual maturity looks like. I could do something, but I won't do it. Because some people would try to bait you into distractions. Don't try to bait me into something. Make me do. Okay. All right. Here it is. Jesus and his crew are now leaving the synagogue. They take a step outside of the synagogue, and there they find a blind man. Verse number one, as he was leaving, as he was leaving, uh, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? That he was born 
blind. Check this out. They said, who sinned, this man or his parents? Now, I got to back this up for you for a second. This is the disciples, the followers of Jesus. They just left the synagogue. They just left church. They just left church, and they encounter an individual in a great need. And the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, who sinned? They want to know the details of his dysfunction. Instead of ministering to him, they want to know the T. They, they want to know the T. Ooh, what happened? They did. I just want to know what to pray by. They say, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? Which one? So now you're trying to make Jesus choose. Which man? This one or his parents? So watch this. Notice, he, notice that the disciples acknowledged this man's potential sin. Notice that they acknowledged the parent's potential sin. But they're leaving somebody's sin out. They didn't mention their own sin. <laughs> they said, just leave me alone. <laughs> Let's deal with him. And deal. But they didn't mention their own sin. That's interesting. That's interesting that somebody you were supposed to minister to, they withheld the opportunity to minister to them. They assumed that they knew what was wrong. Watch this, because we see assumption plus ignorance equals distance. They, because of their assumptions, it led them into, it, it exposes their ignorance, which then created distance between them and the man. Now they dehumanized this man as if he had done something that they, did, they never did. So, so watch this. Watch this. This man, Jesus goes on and said, neither one of them did. But watch this. They didn't understand that all it took really was one bad day before they, they could be in the situation that he was in. See, it's hard to minister to the streets when you think you're above them. It, it, it's, it's hard to minister when you think they're beneath you. It's hard to minister to, it's hard to love anybody that you think is beneath you. So, so what ends up happening is they assume something about this man. Um, they were ignorant to their own, uh, will, willful ignorance to their own issues, which then created distance. Now, how are you going to minister to somebody you just judged? How are we going to hit the streets if you're judging the people that we're going to hit the streets? How are we going to, how are we going to, how is somebody going to accept Christ if we're so busy trying to argue that they're wrong than embracing where you all agree? So the disciples, the disciples have this conversation, right? And um, we understand that this man didn't necessarily do anything. Jesus said that it, it's nothing that he did because at the end of the day, life be life in. And if you're not careful, all it takes is one bad week. One bad month. If I had time, I'd go down story after story of, of individuals that, that are without homes and living on the street. And, and most people think, hey, well, this person must be uh, addicted to drugs or this person might have mental illness. Oh, they, oh here's one. Oh, they just lazy. I, uh oh, I'm coming for somebody. I ain't giving them no $3. They just lazy. Really? Really? What if I told you that many of them encountered the same things that many of us encountered. I, I could tell you about stories about individuals with more degrees than all of us in here. Lawyers, doctors even, family, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank. Spouse died, didn't know how to handle it. Baby died, never bounced back from it. Lost a job, family act funny on them, didn't know how to come back. And we take for granted, oh, they just lazy, they just want to go. No, 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 they don't necessarily want to. They don't want to. But life be life in. <laughs> life be life in. Some of us, we can get one text message that'll change everything. Tell the truth. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to humanize this individual that needs to be ministered to. 
the people that we see, because yes, we can see that he's blind, but there's other individuals too that we can touch. So I'm humanizing him so that we understand that the reality is we're just like him. You're just not blind to the degree that people can see. What if, Lord, have, Lord have mercy, don't do this, God, don't ever do this. But what if, Lord Jesus, don't do this. But what if he did? What if he plugged in the, the, the video footage of your life and we all had a front row seat to watch what 18 years old looked like for you? 21. Somebody said, Lord, not 18. Jesus. <laughs> What if we? What if? What if the divine videographer was just following us and all through Club Iguana, and y'all was just South Beach Memorial? Y'all was like freaking it. It was just everywhere. You. I mean, we just watching like, ooh, girl, girl, he is cheating on you. <laughs> y'all all right? What, what, what if we were sitting there watching behind the scenes footage? Overnight bag, episode three. <laughs> he, got it, he got it in chapters, too. <laughs> Tune in tomorrow. For she went back again. <laughs> He's cheating again. Episode 19. What am I doing? I'm humanizing the people that we have to minister to. Because all it takes is one bad decision. I got to put a praise. I got to put a pen right here so I can put a praise. I want to thank this for the 15 people who would thank God that even when you made the wrong decisions, you still didn't suffer the consequences you should have suffered. All right. This for the real people. This for the, this ain't for the fake church. All the fake people, y'all can go to another church. But for the rest of us that can say for real, for real, I made some decisions. I did it. I set it up. I prepared for it. I packed it. I made it. I made it. But God, I'm so glad that I didn't get what I deserved. It was nothing but your grace and your mercy. Some people, y'all so perfect, you can't minister. But I'm telling you right now that there were some seasons of my life where I knew I was wrong. Y'all ain't going to say nothing. I knew what I was doing. They didn't trick me. I wasn't drugged. I did it. But I'm so glad that God saw past my stupidity and still showed his sovereignty. Y'all ain't... Anything can happen. That's why we run and jump and shout, Lord have mercy, I got to get out of here. The reason that we do that, the reason that I don't care if you see me cry when I'm over here, the reason I don't care if you think I'm absolutely insane because you don't know what it's like to be blind. You've had your sight too long. But I know what it's like to have my issues and my hangups and my mistakes and my failures. And it wasn't just one time that he reached down and got me. It wasn't just two times that he reached down and rescued me. It wasn't just three. Y'all ain't saying nothing in here. It wasn't just three times. But over and over again, he kept. He kept getting me. He kept getting me. So this man, this blind man, we don't even know his name. All we know is his dysfunction. We don't even know who this brother is. We don't know if he got a family. We don't know nothing. All we know is that he's blind. He's defined by his dysfunction. Jesus rolls up on him. Y'all don't even see faith. Y'all don't know when to shout over favor. It's, let me tell you something. So what they would do is, the blind beggars, what they would do is, they would hang out outside the church. Because it makes sense. You just got a good word from God. You understand what I'm saying? You just got a good word from God. Ain't no way you're going to walk right past me and don't get, that's like somebody out there right now once you leave. They got the best possible chance of you giving them some money because you just left church. So smart. This is a smart thing to do. So here it is. He's sitting there with a bunch of other uh, blind individuals, beggars. They, re they relied on other people's generosity for their well-being, right? 
Jesus stops at him. There were others there, but Jesus stops at him. So the disciples said, who's saying this man or his parents? Jesus says, none of them. You're wrong. You're wrong and you're wrong again. <laughs> he says, actually, this one here, this one is, for, is, is so that the glory of God might be seen. This is going to mess up somebody's theology right here. He says, this issue that you're looking at is that is so that the glory of God might be revealed. Like, what? Yeah. Hold on. You mean to tell me that God, you knew all about what he was going through and you didn't save him from it? So if he didn't save him from it, then he was going to use it for his glory. See, sometimes we're praying, God, take it away. And God says, I don't want to take it away. I want you to overcome it so I can use it. <laughs> okay, fellas, I, I just got the ladies with the front row, so I got to come. Sometimes, like, guys, you got to be careful because sometimes we're praying, like, we're trying to get our flesh under control, all this stuff, you know. We try, man, I gotta stop. Oh, I got to stop. This is what we do. We start rubbing our chest. <laughs> because when you rub your chest, the word of God gets in. It's like just rubbing in. Start rubbing our chest like, man, I got You know, when we feel like we got to slow down, we're out there trying to mess with too many women, this, that, that, just tighten up. And, and, and where we go wrong is, and I talk to guys all the time, where we go wrong is you're sitting there trying to suppress something that God gave you. You don't have to suppress your flesh. You have to submit your flesh. Yeah. Are y'all all right? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to walk light because we got the babies. Put some headphones. So you praying, God, take it away. I don't need that. No, 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 no. You're going to need that, Ralph. You're going you're gonna to need it. You're going to need that. Hallelujah. Oh, I felt God on that. Don't tell him take it away. No, no, no. You, no, 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 no. I buy that. You're going to need it. Don't, don't, but don't suppress it. Submit it. In other words, submit it means give it to God, and whatever God says about it, do that. Whatever his word says about it, do that. All right. Ah, I got to go. Watch this. So, 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 are y'all enjoying this? All right. So, so, so life be lifing. All it takes is one text message for us to go from this to that. One phone call. You can leave here today. Get one call. Ruin your whole day. Tell the truth. So when I look at somebody who's blind, I don't just see a blind man. I see me. Jesus says, verse number three, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but, the, but this happened so that the works of God, here we go, may be displayed. The works of God may be displayed in him. I want you to look at something. When something is displayed, that means it's put out there for other people to see. It is a display model, right? Um, oh God, okay. So the disciples and other people believe he was dealing with his blindness because of something he did, when in actuality, it was because of something that God was getting ready to do. His issue was an invitation for a sovereign demonstration. His issue was an invitation for a sovereign demonstration. Your issue is an invitation for a sovereign demonstration. Whatever, whatever I'm supposed to teach today, whatever you're going through, whatever thing you've been struggling with, it is an invitation if it's submitted for God to, inter to interrupt and intervene inside of that situation. Your issue is not a distraction, it's an invitation. It is, it is a welcome sign for the, for the God that we serve. It is not an obstacle, yet it is an opportunity if it is submitted to God. Let me finish the sentence. Somebody submitted to me. No, submitted. <laughs> I do what I want to do. It's submitted to God. So be careful not to label something too soon. 
Because you're calling it a distraction. God says that's an invitation. Yeah. Says so that, the, so that the glory of God, God may be displayed. Jesus then says, I'm, I'm skipping a little bit. I'm going down to verse number, uh, verse number six. Uh, Jesus says this. He says, after saying that, he spit on the ground. Jesus did. Made some mud with saliva. Okay. Um, he put it on the man's eyes. Verse number seven. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. Uh, so the man went, washed, came home seeing. Second thing I see in the text, I see instruction plus obedience equals miracles. I, I see instructions plus obedience equals miracles. Watch this. I see Jesus, verse number seven, says, go wash. So the man went and washed. <laughs> do you see that? Do you, you don't see the delay in obedience, do you? You see, this is the same verse. The same verse. So go and wash. So the man went and washed. This is important because disobedience disables divine demonstration. Disobedience will disable divine demonstration. Our disobedience will disable divine demonstration. In other words, it's possible for God to want to do something, but our disobedience hinders him from doing it. It's, it's, it's like the picture of a parent that has a child that you want to get a gift for, but yet they come back with a bad report card or bad behavior. So it's like, ah, man, I want to. Ah, all right, well, okay. Right? It's that picture. Right? So this is important. So this, a, this honor disables divine demonstration. So I was, side note, just I'll come back to the sermon, but so I was, in, I was in college, right, and when I got to FAM, FAM, you in the house. All right, so when I got to FAM, yeah, 1884. So when I got to FAM, <laughs> highest of seven hills. So when I got to, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, when I got to FAM, all right, so the, the, the apartment complex that I was uh, supposed to live in were not ready yet. So they put us in a hotel. They put us on Tennessee Street. Across from the Popeyes, not run down the street from Popeyes, right? That lets you know where we at, right? So anyway, I said, "Oh Jesus, all right." So it's Tennessee Street, yeah, yeah, yeah. We was, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here it is. I get to the hotel and first experience at college at all. Just first, just getting to Tallahassee, don't know anybody or anything. Get there, I was like, "Hey, I got to get my room," and uh, they said, "We have a room for you, such and such and such." Do all of that, check in, uh, get my key. And then I asked them to give me another key because I know I'm going to lose that first one. Anybody like me, I lose 17 keys. So I, I said, let me get two keys. Got two keys, put them in my pocket. Got the paperwork situated. Got my phone, put it in my pocket. Headed up to my room. I'm on the 10th floor. I got to go all the way up to the 10th floor. It's, it's almost the picture of like a haunted house type deal. It's, yeah, it was, not, it was not a smooth ride to the 10th floor. It was like, Lord, are we going to make it to the 10th floor? This was one of those. So here it is. I, I'm, I'm getting to the 10th floor. I get to my room. I'm like, mm, I'm excited. Got my bags, whatever. I get to the door, pull my key out, put the key in front of the thing. This is before they had the phone, all that stuff. Put the key in front of the thing, and I kept getting the little red signal. I couldn't get in the room. I'm tripping. So I'm like, well, he gave me two keys. I'm put the other one. Put the other key. I can't get in the room. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Now I got to go, this is me in my mind, I got to go all the way back downstairs, down the creepy crawly elevator. I don't know if something's going to jump out, kill me, whatever's going. So now I get, I gather my bags, get back on the elevator, come all the way down, slam the car, slam the key on the table like I'm playing spades or something with the big joker. So I, boom, I'm like, yo, this key don't work. He said, he said what do you mean? Did you try both of them? I said, yeah. I said, I don't know what's going on. I said, well, you work here. You need to know what's going on. <laughs> I don't know. How am I supposed to know? You know what? So he says, oh, let me check it. Puts the key in the machine. Ah, he says, I think I know what happened. I said, what do you think happened? Um, he said, what, what pocket did you have your phone in? I say, the same pocket I had the key in. He said, oh, well, that's what happened. Your phone disabled your key. So the room that was reserved for you, you can't get in it because you got something on you that was disabling your entry into the thing that I had reserved for you. I said, you kidding me? 
I didn't think about this then, but I thought about it now, that it's possible for us to have something on us that's prohibiting us from walking into what God has in store for us. Yes, it's reserved for us, but we won't be able to walk into it if we're still weighed down with disobedience, weighed down with... So it was when I was willing to separate some stuff in my life. Lord, have mercy. It was when I was willing to separate my phone from my key. Because the, mm, the, the stuff, here's the problem. What was happening with my phone was impacting where I go in my future. Now I can't get in something that's mine. I don't have time to touch that, but you just hit something. If I had time, I don't have time, but if I did, I would tell, we would talk about the phones. We would talk about the physical phones that we have and how much of that is aiding us in our relationship with God and how much of it is separating us because, when you, because it's hard to read scripture on the same phone you watch porn on. It's, it's hard. I'll go here. It, blame Pastor Sonia. It's hard. It's hard to study your word when you know you're studying something else. And you go from Instagram to their page. From their page, you close Instagram. And then you go to Safari. Uh-oh. And then you type in that. Oh, I ain't going to name nothing because I ain't got that much words in my vocabulary. It's too many. So I'm just put a blank. So you type that in. So now you're there. And now you leave there. Now you got to call somebody. Because you ain't do that just to do that. Come on, somebody. You can. Are y'all, is my microphone, did they turn it off? Is it muted? It's on. It's, it's on. Okay. So now, now you need somebody to fulfill what you've just been playing with. You're flirting with your fatality. Samson, why are you flirting with, uh, you don't know what's going to take my strength. Why are you flirting with Delilah like that? She's trying to kill you. The problem is, we don't see that Satan is trying to kill us. We want to have fun with Satan. Let me get out of here. That's for me at week. So the disobedience disabled divine demonstration. We got to stop feeding what's killing us, y'all. I'm sorry. I can't move. We got to stop feeding what's killing us. We have got to stop feeding what's killing us. Our flesh is so much stronger than our spirits. That's why we'll stay bound. But if you want to get free, you got to start feeding your spirit more than you do your flesh. Turn off the TV. Turn off this website. Ain't nothing happening. The same people that was on there yesterday are on there today. Turn that down. Feed your spirit, man. Listen to some worship. Turn off the breakfast club and get a devotional. Turn off the podcast and listen to some preaching. Are y'all here? I don't know why I went there. <laughs> Jesus says, let me get to the text. I think, I don't know. He says, go and wash. Same verse, the man went and washed and got a miracle. His miracle followed his obedience. Can't skip the process. Because God's word isn't just to be heard, it's to be heeded. It, it, it's, it was this man's, this, man's, this man's miracle was faith-induced. He did something that God didn't agree with. He said, put, put some spit and mud on the man's face. I say, whoa, 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 you got to do something else. That's, you know, other way, like, you healed other people before. Like, you just sent the word at one person, like, can you do one of those? You got to do the, why I got to be so messy? That's nasty. I mean, I want the healing, but I don't want it to be, like, that messy. But if we're honest, some of our deliverance is going to be messy. People don't tell you that. I'm talking about how we minister, okay, how we evangelize. That's what this series is. Really, it's a series on evangelism. But I want to show you something. I need you to understand something. The reason 
that you you drop that, then you pick that back up, or you've been struggling with that for years, and then you pick, and then you and then you go back and forth, and then I ain't doing that no more, and then Lord, why did I do that? And then this that that's cool, that's fine, that's part of the process. It's a messy transition, isn't it? And what we want to do is we want to skip the process and tell people about the ending result. We want to tell them, I don't do that no more. Well, what happened when you were doing it, you wasn't doing it as much? Somebody needs, somebody is not at the no more point. Somebody need to know that there's somebody like you that wrestled with it but got through it. Or, are, or is getting through it. So, um, his word is not just to be heard. Uh, don't just be hearers of the word. Be, be, be doers. He says go. And whenever God says, tells us to go, it's an action. It's an action that he's looking for. The woman caught in adultery, he told her to go and sin no more. Luke 9, the Good Samaritan, Jesus tells us about what biblical love should look like and how he takes care of people. And then at the end of the day, he says, go and do likewise. He, he, uh, John, uh, Matthew, Matthew uh, talks about go, therefore, and make disciples. So in essence, when God is telling us to go, we can't stay. When God is calling us to, to invade the streets with his love or to saturate the streets, it's really a, it's, it's, an, it's an admonition for us to move from where we are, the place of comfort that we are, and move to where he's calling us. Watch what he says. Verse number 24 says this. A second time they surround, they summoned the man who had been blind. And they said this, give glory to God. By telling, by telling the truth, they said, we know this man is a sinner. This is where I'm going to hang out at. Watch what he says to him. Verse number 25, he says, whether, I'm going to be honest with y'all, whether this man is a sinner or not, he said, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to let y'all handle that. I'm not here to argue that. Um, but one thing I do know is that I was blind. And now I can see. He's, the reason that this is important, keep that right there. The reason that this is important is because they want to engage with this blind man theologically. Because the religious leaders did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They were calling him, as a matter of fact, a sent from Satan or a demon or demonic or, or this, 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 this false king, this, 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 this individual is not the Messiah. So for this blind man to say, I don't know. I'm not going to debate. I'm not getting on the level because I don't have time to be arguing back and forth about your Christology and how you see Christ. He says, all I can tell you is I was blind. See, see, I'm talking about how we how we evangelize. Watch this. Nobody can take what God did from you, did for you. Nobody will be able to argue what happened, what God did for you. He says, I'm not going to argue about all of these trivial matters, should I do this or should I do that? And what day is the Sabbath? And should we have church on this day or that day? And, 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 and how old was Jesus? And did Jesus know how to drive a car? Like all this crazy, how tall was Jesus? Like I'm not going to, he says, I'm not going to argue all of that. Here's, here's what I can tell you. I was blind. I know what it's like. And I want, you to, I want you to see something because I don't want us to hear ourselves in light of the, 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 the disciple. I don't want us to see ourselves in light of the disciple. I want us to understand what it feels like to be a man born blind. This is a grown man now who's had to maneuver his entire life without the functionality that he wanted. Do you know how bad he wanted to be able to see? Imagine him at 15 years old. Imagine him at 10. Imagine him at 6. Imagine him at 25. Do you know how much, how bad he wanted to see? And here the religious, religious leaders coming, and they're saying to him, stop telling people that Jesus did this for you. So they literally said, they called his friends, and his friends said they couldn't even really recognize him. His friends said, I look like his him. I don't, you know. Then they said, well, call his parents. They called his parents to the front. They in the synagogue. His parents get to the front. 
His parents says, I can attest. This is what the mama said. He says, I can attest he was born blind. Right? But, she says, ask him. Because the reason she said that is because she was in fear. Because if they made a proclamation that Jesus was in fact, the, or that they believed that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, they would get put out of the church. This kind of stuff happens in the church. They would get put out of the church. So she said, ask him. He's an adult. Meaning, whatever he says, let him be the one that deal with the punishment. So I can attest, he was born blind, but I'm not saying nothing because whatever. So he says, I'll tell you one thing. I'm not going to argue with all of that. But I, te- I can tell you this. I was blind, but now I can see. They said, you're lying. I said, no, 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 no. Take. Here's what's not in the text. I'm done. What we don't see in the text is the individuals that were in the church, in the synagogue, that were listening in to this conversation. What we don't see is the people that did give him, that did patronize him, that did give him some of their benevolence, that did give him a few dollars, that does know that his story was that he was blind. You don't see those people in the story, but you do know that they have been impacted because they know for sure this brother wasn't always like this, and now he is. What am I saying? You don't know who's watching your transformation. You don't know. And we got to be so careful not to beat ourselves up because we're in process. Don't beat yourself up because you're in process. Transformation is a process. God is consistently working, continually working through you. So what that means is there are people that are looking and they're saying, oh, she used to do that. She don't do that anymore. He used to do, oh, wow. They'll never say anything, but they're watching. So the question is, can you see clearly what God is doing in you? Or are you too busy condemning yourself and because of what you think you're not yet? And, and man, that's sent from Satan. But can you see clearly, God, you've been working on me. God, I'm not perfect. I got some stuff that, you know, I'm still, you know. But I can tell you right now, I can see that you've been working on me. And if you can acknowledge that God has been working on you, I promise you that there's people that can see it too. No, you're not perfect. You're not. I'm sorry to break the news. You're not perfect. You got issues. I got issues. But one issue we won't have is leaving Jesus Christ. That if I got to go through something, I'm going through it with him. That I'm bringing my imperfect self right to Jesus every time. Lord, I need you to work on I'm coming back tomorrow, and Lord, work on it again. And God, and work, and keep working. Because if you ever take your hand off me, I don't know what I would do. I can see clearly now that you are at work in my life. That is what the streets need. That is what your students need. That is what the people in your job need in the break room. That's what they need in the boardroom. That's what they need wherever it is that you frequent. They, they need to know that. What you, tell me about your story. Don't tell me about I don't know him yet. I don't know Abraham. I know you. And all you have to do is say, well, let me tell you something. I used to be, I used to be a mess. I, I promise you. There's times where I, I made some mistakes, and there's other times where I didn't even make a mistake. I was trying to do it. And I'm telling you that the same God that protected me then is the same God that can do it for you now. Can you see that? Would you stand to your feet? I want to pray for you. Father, we thank you right now for each and every person under the sound of my voice. God, I pray that you open the eyes of our hearts to see how good you've been to us in the process that you've taken us through. And God, allow us now that we acknowledge it, allow us now to take it and spread it everywhere that we go. Give us the grace to turn this world upside down. Allow us not to be silent about your your move.